Hey guys, it's Miss Neal. I am sorry about the confusion on Friday. I thought I hit the button to copy it to all the classes and it didn't copy to all the classes. And then for some reason I forgot to unlock it for first block. So we're just gonna have a redo of Friday. Um, so if you were in second or third block and you noticed there was nothing posted, you're right, there was nothing posted. Um, we're gonna have a redo, we're gonna start the unit over again today. You were already ahead of the days of uh, people in class by one day, so you'll just be on the same day as them now. So it'll work out just fine. So we finished the last unit talking about a kind of dermata, and we're gonna move on to hemichordata. So these also have that deuterostome development. This means that when the blastula starts to go in to make a cyst, this, in, this input right here, this cleavage, is going to become the anus and not the mouth. So that's where we are. So echinoderms have that and vertebrates have that. And we're gonna start getting into vertebrates, but we're not quite completely there yet. We are in a in-between phylum for today. So we're not in phylum chordata today and we're no longer in phylum echinodermata. We're kind of in the middle. And we're gonna talk about hemichordates and invertebrate chordates. So chordates means that it has a somewhat of a backbone, but not a true backbone. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So echinoderms, hemichordates and chordates are most likely derived from a common undiscovered ancestor since they all share the same deuterostome characteristics. So that means a mammal, a bird, a reptile, an amphibian, a bony fish, a tunicate, a hemichordate, a starfish. We all came from a common ancestor. We just don't know what that common ancestor could be yet. We haven't discovered it yet. We don't know where it is. It's yet to be discovered. It could be in the ocean. It could be on land. It could be in one of the Arctic ice caps. We're discovering new things every day. With DNA evidence, we might find out that even though we have the same development as echinoderms, we're not completely related at all. So it's kind of all up in the air right now. So for cladistically right now, this is where it's categorized. But remember, cladistics can always change. So what makes a chordate? In order to be a chordate, you have to have a dorsal hollow nerve cord. You have to have a notochord. You have to have pharyngeal slits or pouches. And you have to have a post-anal tail. You have to have all of these things at some point in your development. Now, you might lose them later on in your development, but at some point in your development, you must have all of these things. You might be real confused right now and say, but Miss Neal, humans don't have gills. You'd be right, humans don't have gills. We have pharyngeal gill slits, though, embryonically when we're developing. So, um, chordates and hemichordates both share pharyngeal gill slits, and we most have a dorsal nerve cord. Um, because we all have pharyngeal slits and because we all have that dorsal hollow nerve cord, um, it shows that the evolutionary ties between a hemichordate and a chordate are closer than echinoderms and hemichordates or echinoderms and chordates because echinoderms don't have pharyngeal slits and echinoderms don't have a hollow nerve cord. So it shows us that the closer relationship between echinoderms, hemichordates, and chordates, of all of them, the closest two relations are the hemichordates and the chordates. And that's why I'm teaching them together or in the same unit. So if you look here, we have echinoderms. And today we're going to talk about these. These are our hemichordates. Tomorrow, we're going to move on to chordates, and everything from then on out is going to have a notochord. But these hemichordates have this dorsal hollow nerve cord. They have pharyngeal gill slits. So everything we talk about today, hollow nerve cord, pharyngeal gill slits. Hemichordate means a half cord, and it is the name for acorn worms and terebranchs. And they can live in or on marine sediments. So they can live inside the sand, or they can live on top of the sand. Excuse me. So hemichordates are marine. They have deuterostem development. And they have three segments. They have a proboscis, a collar, and a trunk. They have pharyngeal slits. They have an open circulatory system a complete digestive tract, and they have a dorsal nerve co cord. Sometimes it's hollow, sometimes it's not. All depends. Depends on the animal we're looking at. So class Interoptinusta are the acorn worms. 
Um, their name, because of their proboscis at the anterior end, looks like an acorn. There's 75 species of them. They're usually anywhere from 10 to 40 centimeters long. Uh, they mostly occupy U-shaped burrows along the shoreline. So most of all of this is in this U-shaped burrow with only their mucus-covered proboscis and their cilia helping them in feeding. You can see their collar right here and their gill slits. The next class are the terebranchia, and this means wing or feather gills. Um, there's around 20 species of them. They're usually five millimeters. Um, tiny, tiny, tiny little guys. Their proboscis is shield-like, and it secretes a tube for the animal to live in. They're in the deep oceans of the southern hemisphere, and they use cilia on their arms and tentacles to transport the food into their mouth. So let's take a look at what these guys look like. Um, you can see right here, here's their proboscis, which is making that shield. This is the tube-like secretion, so each one of these is a separate animal. So you can see in this picture of one alive, so this one's alive, this one is dead, obviously. The only thing that's left is that shield. Um, you can see the tentacles and the food grooves coming out right here. If you look at the picture of it and how it looks inside each of these little pouches, you've got your gill slit over here. You've got your proboscis, or your, sorry, yes, your proboscis and your oral shield. You've got your anus. So it basically takes the food. It goes in the mouth right here. It processes through the body and it comes back out the anus back here. Here's your dorsal hollow nerve cord. Those are the two things, remember, the dorsal hollow nerve cord and the gill slit that we're looking for. Phylum chordata. Phylum chordata has bilateral symmetry and they're also deuterostomes. They have a notochord, a dorsal nerve cord, a post-anal tail present at some point during their development, and pharyngeal slits or pouches. They have an endostyle or a thyroid gland which can produce mucus. They have a complete digestive tract, and they have a contractile blood vessel or a heart. So the notochord, let's see if I can get rid of this little thing in the back because it's going to bug me. Okay. The notochord is a supportive rod that extends most of the length of the body. Pharyngeal slits are a series of openings along the pharyngeal reading. And vertebrate chordates use them for filter feeding, and some chordates do use them for gas exchange. The dorsal hollow nerve cord runs the length of the body, and it's associated with complex sensory systems. And the post-anal tail extends posterior to the anus. Most chordates develop this same look, this same development, at some point in time in their structure, or in their development. We all look exactly the same. We begin to differentiate, but those first few weeks, we all look exactly the same in our development. So in the subphylum Eurochordata, we have some marine animals. Some are solitary, others are colonial, they're sessile adults. But as we've seen in most animals that are sessile in their adult life, their larval forms are mo modal, they can swim. Because of these larval forms, they are considered chordates. Um, in their larval form, they have all five chordate characteristics. They eventually settle on their head first on a hard substrate, and they undergo metamorphosis. It's pretty dramatic. They lose their tail. They lose their notochord. They lose any muscle that they had, and they lose their nerve cord. So here's our free-swimming larva, our pharynx, our anus, our heart, our notochord, our nerve cord, our tail. They're going to attach head first. You can see as it all starts to disintegrate, well, not disintegrate, go through metamorphosis, and we end up with a little animal that looks like this. They're fondly known as sea squirts or tunicates. So the adult body is covered by an outer envelope or an outer layer called a tunic. Gee, that could be why they call them tunicates. Um, it's composed of protein, salts, and cellulose. The tunic wraps around this structure called the pharynx. You have an in-current siphon and an ex-current siphon like you would have in a clam or any bivalve. So you've got your insert current siphon. That in-current siphon does have um, a basket-like pharynx that has perforated gill slits. They're filter feeders, so the plankton is trapped in a sheet of cilia and mucus. 
and it directs the feed laden mucus to the stomach down here at the bottom. The water leaves the animal through this X current siphon. There's about 45 species of the, of, oh wait, nope, sorry. Whew. Subphylum Uricodata. Subphylum Cephalochordata. So cephalo means head, chordata means cord. So these guys are very primitive chordates and they have a head and a cord. They're exclusively marine. They look like tadpoles. They can get up to about five centimeters, so they're still relatively tiny. They are capable of swimming, though they usually bury themselves in the sand with only their head showing, and they live in shallow waters, clean sands. So they have all their chordate characteristics present throughout their entire life. They're filter feeders. So inside the hood, the oral hood, is it's lined with cilia, and they call that a wheel organ. And that wheel organ helps to create a siphon or a current. So the cilia and the cilia and the pharynx help develop that water current. So the water goes through the oral hood. It's um, filtered. And they feed by secreting a mucus net across their gill slits. So as the current comes in and then goes out their gill slits, the food gets stuck. And then they redirect that food to their stomach. And that is all I have for today. Um, we're going to go more in depth into phylum chordata and talk about the bigger animals in phylum chordata tomorrow, which are the fish. So we're going to start talking about fish tomorrow. We're going to talk about the jawless fish. Then we're going to move into the cartilag cartilaginous fish. Then we're going to move to the bony fish, which there's two different types. There's ray finned bony fish. I meant, yes, there's ray finned bony fish and there's lobe finned bony fish. Um, one of them, the coelacanth, has been around since the dinosaurs, and it was believed actually, some of them were, are actually so old they swam with the dinosaurs. So they're really cool. We're going to finish all of that out before Thanksgiving break. So we've got a lot to do this week. Today, in order to get you ready to start talking about the jawless fish, go ahead and read the article on the jawless fish and answer the questions and turn it in. So if you're here on Schoology, You are going to read this article and answer these questions. Don't forget, your exit ticket is to give an example of an animal that's a hemichordate and explain what makes it a hemichordate. Um, use Google. Google can definitely Google animals that are hemichordates, and they can definitely help you out with that question. Um, trying to get you involved in a little bit of independent thinking, a little bit of independent research. By all means, please don't forget your VIP attendance ticket, and I will see you tomorrow so we can talk about those jawless fish.